at the crossroads. And the Chaldean nation and church at very particular and critical crossroads of history. Today is the third lecture about the Chaldeans facing their choices in this historic juncture. Very critical. Why? Because it is practically the question of to be or not to be. See, the world is facing this juncture where Christianity is somehow retreating, somehow appeasing the world instead of attacking, attacking hell, evil, and promoting the apostolate of the Lord. Paganism is propagating itself. And Islam is presenting itself as a solution very aggressively, brutally. We spoke about that. The solution is again Jesus. Is always Jesus. The problem is that Jesus has been somehow pushed aside. That is the problem. And the solution is Jesus, but not in generic. No, no, no. Jesus as the bread of life. Jesus as crucified, Jesus as risen, and then, and as such, being given to me and you in the Eucharist, as the bread of life, the sacrificed Lord, and the risen Lord, offered for me and you, and be given to me and you, and to the whole world. That is the problem, is neglecting that, and the solution is going back to that kind of strength and apostolate. That is for the world and Christianity. Today, the topic is about Chaldeans. What about Chaldeans? Chaldeans today are in a very unique situation. In the whole Middle East, including Iraq, their homeland, Chaldeans are maybe a quarter of a million, about 250,000. But in the West, today, in the West, they are about half a million. So today, Chaldeans are not in their historic homeland, Iraq. They are mostly in the West. This is a reality that needs a comprehensive plan, a futuristic plan. I have many times said, and I will repeat today, I'm not at all trying to intervene in what is happening in Iraq. I respect fully the leaders, the hierarchs, uh, the parties, all efforts done in Iraq to do whatever good they can do for all Iraqis and most of all now talking about Chaldeans, what they can do about Chaldeans and all Christians. So Iraq aside, I respect all the effort done there. And I pray for those leaders struggling and trying their best. 
to find solutions and prosperity, freedom and equality to the citizens of that country. That subject apart. I'm talking about Chaldeans in the world and their future. And I'm talking about that in both senses, civilly and ecclesiastically. Civilly, what do I mean? Now, half a million left Iraq, okay, Chaldeans, also other Christians, but mostly Chaldeans. They are in the West. What is the prospect? What's our future? What's the future of our kids? What is at stake? Now, why I question this kind of, of questions? Why I put this kind of questions? Because I think, and I'm convinced, and I know, that Chaldeans are carrying a unique, unique, unique heritage. I mean, you cannot call this land and people and civilization cradle of civilization. How many cradles can humanity have? How many? If you are a child and you look at the whole history as a comprehensive history of humanity, okay, and you say, this is my childhood. This is my cradle. This is where I have learned the basics. That is, you cannot have two childhoods. There is only one, one childhood for humanity. And if that childhood, that cradle, that initial growth, that opening of the eyes, of the mind, of the intellect, and of the conscience happened there today's Chaldeans carry that continuity you would say how yeah only Chaldeans only no 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 only Chaldeans sorry but I can prove it through their language I can prove it through their language. Chaldean language is the Aramaic of Iraq. It's the only language having 3,000 years of continued history. And amazingly, not taught even in the schools or by a state or by some institution, but parents to children is the only the <coughs> it is the only people carrying that heritage so my dear Chaldean fellow and all dear listeners Chaldeans do you think that your role is finished through history? If you are the witness to what? To that awakening. To that opening of the eyes. Oh, God, spiritual God, created the whole universe and me. Oh, God, make me somehow divine because he gave me his breath. Oh, I wanted to become like God. I was tempted. Can you imagine that this is today the problem? Today it's the same problem of Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve 
were seen as such by my ancestors, by the Chaldean ancestors. They were seen as, oh, come on, if you eat, you will become like God. Well, that is the temptation of humans today. That is today's problem. We want to become God. That's when I want to decide who I am, not who God made me. It is the same sin. So Chaldeans had foreseen the original plan of God and they have realized the temptation and the fall. And today we are at the same situation. That's why Chaldeans Abraham was called for a solution. You can be called again. You are called again for a solution. Yes, Jesus was exactly the result of that, of that course. Divine course for salvation is the result, and the result he, at the end, the focus is my solution. Hey, <laughs> you are no God. That is what the devil told you to do. That's what the serpent told our forefathers. And today, we are repeating the same story. And the same solution is waiting for us if we go looking for it. So Chaldeans today either they would realize that I am relevant to humankind and I have a mission and I carry a package that has the medicine it has the whole problematic that is repeated itself today and the medicine is with me and I have even the lab to produce it <coughs> or run away and say I don't care it's up to you Chaldeans I know for myself that to me is so appealing, is so great, is so fulfilling that I consider myself I would be dumb if I turn it down. I would be coward if I would turn it down. And I will be most rich if I can grasp it. Carry, carry the ball, go for a touchdown, run for a touchdown. God is with you. He's the one who installed that in your history and in your mind and conscience. Come on. That is the call. How can we do it? How Chaldeans can do that? I said, Iraq, do what you can. God bless you for what you are doing and God help you. God's feet. But for everyone else, Oh, first of all, there is something that we are doing. We are trying, Chaldeans, to be socially connected. That's something that our people love. 
They have their clubs, their weddings, their funerals, whatever, I mean, happiness or sadness or whatever. They love to be together. Great. That's one great aspect. But we are very weak culturally. And culture implies language, Chaldean language, art, and folklore. We are not strong enough. All over the world, especially in the West, United States, Europe, Canada, Australia, is very important. to have these cultural centers teaching language, art, and folklore. Chaldean language and folklore. It's very important. But I think our people must also consider how to form political circles to debate, to question, to consider, to ponder, to think about the future of Chaldeans as a nation, and design a future. for the Chaldean nation. I think in order to do that, it's very important to think of the formation of Chaldean leaders. Formation of Chaldean leaders. With a comprehensive and succinct program to unify the dispersed Chaldeans in one futuristic vision. This is doable. It's a huge plan, but it's doable. And it's very much needed. So the Chaldean nation should not disperse and practically be assimilated and absorbed in this ocean of humanity because it has a specific mission and role that is very much needed for the salvation of the world. But most of all, the Chaldean Church. <laughs> you say, what? Well, Chaldean Church is very small. I mean, come on, the Latin Church is millions and millions, hundreds of millions, and even other churches, Russian, Greek, there are huge churches. <laughs> they cannot fill the gap that the Chaldean Church fills. It's unique. Unique, again, it's unique. What kind of gap is this? The Chaldean Church is the only one to embody a cultural and liturgical continuity with what the Lord has done and his apostles fulfilled. The only church. Oh, the Latin church. <laughs> no, no, no. It's not in cultural continuity with the Lord. Jesus, there is no proof at all that he spoke Latin. Maybe he heard a few Roman soldiers saying a few words here and there. Okay. But he did not speak Latin. Maybe he knew some Greek because it was surrounded by by many Greek merchants and physicians and other educated people, but that's the extent of it. 
Hindu-Hebrew because he would read in the synagogue but he spoke Aramaic. And it's not a matter of language. It's the forms of mind. I can debate today what he may have said. Whoever eats my body, probably, or whoever would eat my flesh. I would debate that. I may debate that in Aramaic. Pusra ya pagra. And I can show the difference and where he may have said Pusra, flesh, or pagra, body. Because <laughs> Each one is different from the other. Pusro Dimma. Flesh and blood. Bagra. Bagra is both. It's both. In Aramaic. In Chaldean. And so on. Not only the words. But the concept. You see, if you say, our Father who art in heaven, <laughs> has six words. Babel, Dvishmaya, there are two. Uh, you see, the forms of language, they mean what really you are wanting to to say what's the concept behind them so yes we can translate it's not dogmatic it's not the main thing it's not needed for salvation i understand but in order to understand jesus this is the one of great ways Chaldeans are those who, before Jesus, at least 1,000 years and more, have that continuity of culture. And it's not only language, customs, language, uh, folklore, and so on parables, concepts, philosophy. One thousand before Jesus, at least as a culture, as a language. You know, when you say son of man, <laughs> I don't know what, what you would understand, but when you say Barnasha, it's very clear what is the meaning. Very clear. Barnasha, oh, when you're the son of man, I've got to interpret it, to, to explain it. But when you say Barnasha, it's so clear in the Aramaic language. So it is, I carry that, you can then carry that. It's not only cultural, but the peak. The climax of this culture is the liturgy. And the climax of the liturgy is the Eucharist. It is the only church that preserves, the Chaldean church, the only church that preserves an anaphora, that means a consecration prayer that comes from apostolic times.
I assure you that the salvation of the world is in the Eucharist. And the problem of the world, and when I say Eucharist, I mean Jesus being crucified and risen, and now that's, this happens. This happened one time. It happened one time. Once. But it's repeated in every celebration, in every celebration of the Mass, we go again to Golgotha and to the empty tomb. See how important is celebrating that with that genuineness. It's very important. The Chaldean Church preserved that and should never never can allow to lose it so at the end I am addressing Chaldeans and telling them it's up to you as a nation <laughs> you want to be absorbed by this world, by the ocean of today's civilizations and cultures, or you will come and say, Lord, yeah, you called my ancestor the son of my nation, Abraham, and told him, come! You have a special mission. I could hear that same call to me. And come together and preserve that blessing that you have gave to my ancestors, to my forefathers. But most of all, the Chaldean church. You know, the church of Koche. Koche was suburb. Koche means slums. They were slums in the suburb of Ktesiphon. Ktesiphon was a city built by the Greeks who conquered at that time. Alexander the Great conquered Mesopotamia. And establish uh, his successor established this city as it was like a military base. Ktesiphon and Koche were slums. Koche in Chaldean means Koche, slum, slums, slums, and the suburb of that city. They were given. <laughs> it was not much costly. They were slums, so. Some of those slums were given to Mari, the companion of Eddai, Tejus, who came to that city, to Babylon, and that city in the vicinity of Babylon, and the practically replacement of Babylon, who came and, 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 and established good friendship with one, age, one, one uh, of uh, the personalities of the governor of that city and he gave him uh, some slums as a gift. We can assert historically that this happened around the year 80. Some 45, 50 years after the risen after the resurrection. It is the first, the first, absolute first church in history. That is Koche. In the vicinity of Ktesiphon, in the vicinity of Babylon. That is the apostolic first church where the apostolic liturgy were celebrated very closely up to day 
with very similar EDM, Aramaic EDM, and very similar, almost identical text. How can you lose it? How can Jesus allow you to lose it? How can the apostles allow you to lose it? How negligent would you be if you lose it? Because that takes you to Jesus, takes you to his salvation takes you to his Golgotha, takes you to his tomb, and how he ordered us to celebrate. Do this in memory of me. That takes us there. It is the medicine for today. That's why, dear brothers and sisters, I invite you, if you are Chaldean, to stick to the treasure you have. And everybody else, I have to say, come, share it with me. This is the gift of the Lord. It is for all of us. It's not only for me. It's for all of us. It's the medicine for humanity. Maranatha. O oh Lord, come. To save us of every nation, beginning with ourselves and expanding the whole world and universe. Marana Ta. Come, O oh Lord. Come, Jesus, to save us. God bless you. Oh, oh, oh.